Okay, so today we are going to talk about uh, using semantics and statistics to turn data into knowledge. And the presentation is based on these two uh, articles. So one is an article published in AI magazine 2015, and then there is this paper in ISWC 2013 called Knowledge Graph Identification. So the materials are based on uh, these two articles. So uh, when they refer that they convert data into knowledge, they basically refer to a knowledge graph or a knowledge base. So we can define a knowledge graph as a graph of facts where entities <coughs> are connected by relationships. So we all are familiar <coughs> about the Google knowledge graph, I would assume. So Google users. Uh, Knowledge graph to improve their entity search. While Google Knowledge Graph is uh, mainly developed by human, we have seen um, efforts in automatically constructing these knowledge bases among the AI and semantic web community. Nell is uh, one of the prominent works um, out there. Uh, recently, Google also came up with a similar kind of approach, but still with respect to the size and everything Nell uh, plays a dominant role. Um, so when we talk about this... So Nell, Nell is not usable, uh, a lot of the quality usable... No, uh, you're, or yes, you, you're, right. Search. you're right. Actually that is, uh, let me go through this one. So these are a couple of uh, knowledge graph cons automatic uh, the ways to construct knowledge graphs. So the first one is basically we use some structured sources such as Wikipedia info boxes to build a knowledge graph. So we probably most of you are familiar with the data sets such as DBpedia, Yago and Freebase. So they use structured sources and then we have uh, this other category which extract the information from the web uh, with the help of a fixed ontology or a schema. The nail knowledge base that I talked about belongs to the second category. And then we also have uh, simple fact extraction from the web without using an ontology or a schema. And also there are some other effort which has a more focus on constructing taxonomies uh, rather than the factual knowledge constructing the taxonomies as well. So the work we are going to discuss today belongs to the second category because they try to extract the information from the entire web with a fixed ontology or a schema. Since they are using the information in the web to construct this knowledge graph, so what they basically do is they, we have the internet, then we have this uh, massive amount of data, and we use number of extraction techniques that can be machine learning, NLP, they use lexical techniques, syntactical techniques. So they use these information extraction techniques and then represent those uh, information, those facts in a, in, in a knowledge graph. But the problem is, uh, as we know, internet is very noisy, uh, but uh, they are coming up with the knowledge graph that they are coming up with contain a lot of noise. So that is one of the reason there is very uh, low adaptation of this automatically constructed knowledge graph. What we have seen using by the community is the knowledge base such as either developed by humans such as Google Knowledge Graph or users structured sources of information such as DBpedia. So they, uh, they play a huge role in the applications which are using Knowledge Graph compared to an approaches like NEL. The main problem in the approaches uh, like NEL is the problem that they have a lot of noise data since they rely on the internet. So to give an idea of uh, some types of errors that they have, so this is a very basic uh, thing, the entity co-reference problem. So for an example here, this is for the country Kyrgyzstan. So there can be many uh, syntactic variations that they, are, they have uh, in extracting the information. So they ha instead of having one entity for the country, they will have these multiple variations uh, to refer to the same entity. So this is one problem and then they have certain problems in assigning the type. So this is a real example that uh, you can find on L. So they have label, in, in, when they refer to the label that means it is the type of the 
the things type of the entity. So Kyrgyzstan is labeled both as a bird and a country. So country we can understand, but how did they come up with a bird was because there is this web page where Kyrgyzstan appears where they talked about the images uh, that they took for birds. So that's why they have labeled uh, the Kyrgyzstan as a bird. So basically we have incorrect types where we say Kyrgyzstan is a bird. And then we have uh, this thing where I say Kyrgyzstan located in uh, these, these places. So we have Kazakhstan, Russia, Russia and US. So why they came up with US for an example is there is a uh, phrase called Kyrgyzstan US Air Force Bay. So they basically say this is uh, located in US. So these to give an idea of the type of the problems that this knowledge graph has. So if we have uh, some kind of a schema knowledge about what we are going to represent, for an example, if we know uh, that country, same thing cannot be assigned to both country and a bird, then probably we know there is some, some problem in, in the knowledge graph. So even though we have this kind of constraint or the ontological knowledge, the problem is, so in general what we can do is we can run the reasoning algorithms to see whether there are any inconsistencies in the knowledge graph. But the problem is, as we have talked even in this class, this is a very impractical approach compared to the number of facts that we extract. For an example, Wikipedia has around 1 billion entities. To run a traditional reasoner on top of that 1 billion entities of triple is not a practical task. So, however, we have this information uh, to validate those facts and we need to come up with a better way to identify uh, those noise and come up with better knowledge graphs. So if we revisit the problem again, when they say data, they are talking about the facts that they have extracted directly from the internet. And when they say knowledge, that means they want to convert that. Oh, that your screen is not shared. <laughs> Is it okay for everyone? Yeah, thank you. Sorry about that. Okay, so like I said, when they say data, they talk about an extraction graph with a lot of noise. When they say knowledge, they want to come up with a graph where they have removed this noise, a uh, more consistent knowledge graph. So to discuss the approach in nutshell, so we know that uh, there are facts extracted from web. Usually when we use uh, information extraction techniques in extracting the facts, they assign a confidence score to say how, how confident they are about a particular fact. So we have those uh, statistical information and then, then we have an extraction graph like this. And then uh, we have a ontological information and for the first one, we talked about the entity resolution problem. Probably we can run existing entity resolution algorithm and identify what are the same type of entities. If we know these kind of information, what they want to explore is can we come up with a, a better knowledge graph than the one we have originally where uh, there is not much noise in the graph. So can you just, uh, how do we know those are the same entities? So they run normal co-reference resolution techniques, okay. which are the ideal LVL community. What so, is LVL? So LVL, it is actually they call it label, but basically it refers to type. So now uh, to deal with uh, this problem, what they come up with is a statistical learning approach called probabilistic soft logic. So like I said earlier, the existing traditional reasoning techniques, they suffer from the fact that it takes a lot of time to run these reasoning algorithms. So to 
overcome that what they try to do is they try to use these logic based approaches with statistical based approaches to come up with better more efficient techniques in identifying these inconsistencies so probabilistic soft logic is a type of a statistical learning approach what they what they do is they capture both the structure of the knowledge graph the statistics that are coming from the fact extraction techniques with the logical dependencies between the facts so unlike the traditional reasoning system as most of our familiar with the log logics we know that they assign a truth value either a 1 or 0 for each of the fact and then they uh, deduce the logical rules to come up with the truth values so what they claim is since we don't know these fact extracted from the internet are exactly true or false but we know that there is a confidence value assigned by these information extraction techniques so they want to see whether they can leverage those confidence values to identify what are the uh, more relevant facts which are, which are out there so what this what this technique would do is uh, they they write these facts as the logical formulas uh, in, in the same way we write for stored logic rules and instead of having uh, and or and or logical operators they have this soft uh, truth values so for an example in this case p q r are predicates and with each of these rules they have a weight assigned to each of the rules which is the w so i'll come up with an example how they come up with rules with respect to our scenario so instead of traditional and or logical operators they use these uh, the grounding rules that is out there to come up with the truth values so like we discussed earlier there are these information retrieval techniques which extract uh, facts from the uh, from the entire web so for each of these candidate fact they come up with a uh, fact called rel for an example now we know there is a relationship with uh, relationship r and it connects e, the entities e1 and e2 so they represent this in that way but with each of these things they assign a weight so in this case the weight is uh, assigned based on the confidence value that the fact extraction techniques gives to you and does everyone in the same page is there are any places that i need to explain a little more I see a lot of blank faces. I still do not get how uh, they are fixing the different names using the color press resolution. So that they are not making any contribution. They say that we use uh, existing NLP techniques for <laughs> entity resolution because it is not their contribution. They want to see when we know these different types of NLP techniques and machine learning techniques. So they generate facts. They give confidence values to you. How can I leverage them? We'd still like to know the reference, even if it isn't a contribution to this paper. You know, what yeah, those, I what know those techniques yes. are, because it's given us fits. <laughs> so you can, uh, like, running a simple uh, like entity linking as a problem itself solve that uh, particular issue, right? So if you have uh, two syntactic variations of the same entity, uh, the develop entity linking tool basically the dissemination scenarios that can. So we need lots that, of data uh, for this. this sorry, we need lots of lots of data for this. It depends on the approach. Like uh, there are approaches just based on the on the knowledge bases, like uh, DBpedia. They can use the DBpedia itself and uh, do that. Or you can go on machine learning way. Uh, so either way, uh, there are uh, tools that uh, accomplish the entity linking uh, uh, solution, which basically says that if you have multiple syntactic variations of the uh, different entities you can link it to same resource so you know that this is the same entity even mm -hmm. though you have multiple serializations of the uh, thing in the text can you handle misspellings typos things like that uh, misspellings and typos Ca capitalization variants only. capitalization variants yes misspelling and typos uh, i don't i don't i don't have i don't know on top of my head uh, because we're, we're having this problem on hazard c's with uh, variants for location names. Yeah, but we're not going to have a lot of data for it. Probably. Yeah. We have like two tweets. <coughs> they just give two different names for the same thing. So if you want to discuss this more, like uh, 
if you particularly talking about misspellings, what people uh, do in the literature is to, uh, so you have a, a standard name of the entry, right? And you have different variations of that, so maybe typos, misspellings, so intentionally uh, write it in a different way, right? Cool, like cool, right? right? right. So they do like string similarity measures mm -hmm. and say that if it is like above 0.8 or something, I consider this as a mention and try to see which entity it is. Okay. We probably should not pursue this in more detail here, but, but this is something that Hussein is working on. And my understanding, and you can clarify for me, is that when we look at the way those are scored, mm -hmm. we, we're not so thrilled with the scoring algorithms. Yeah. Um, and there, so, there are matches that are missed that would be uh, yeah. picked up by people and not picked up by the, by the machine. Yeah. Because these uh, algorithms are not meant for short text. They are they are sp okay. specifically designed for a uh, well-written text. Okay. So you would not find uh, cases where you have uh, excessive use, uh, use of uh, shorthand, like yeah. shortened forms of yeah. text. So, so I mean, the Levenstein distance or other things like that work reasonably well, and people use a whole variety of them together of other lexical yeah, things on the so it's, it's, text. No, it's not huh? I mean, not necessarily because of the, the problem of the, the location name. Sometimes have like I saw in the Gazette like nineteen terms of one location name, like so. If you if you want to uh, to get the edit distance, it's not gonna perform well because people use the shorter version of that location name. <coughs> See what I mean? Mm -hmm. So so you can't like for example, I saw in the Chennai flood uh, data set, I saw Balalak School, yeah, which has which is actually Balalak f first secondary whatever whatever and then school. So if you do the edit distance, it's not going to perform yeah, well. Doesn't pick it up. Right. So so there are going to be techniques that uh, do something with single words. There are techniques that do something with collection of words. There are techniques that will have to bring in context and then within that you know try and do the match right the best match effort yeah. kind of thing. So it's a whole variety of things that you have to put together. Then if you have could, C-O-U-L-D versus C-U-D, you know, again, the uh, uh, text, things that work on single words won't work very well. So it will depend on, you know, then you'll have to expand the scope, uh, you know, the windows and see what other words have occurred and based on that, make the best judgment you can. Yeah. All those things will come in picture. But basically, uh, I mean, I think that single techniques, uh, you know, no one single technique works very well. And it all comes down to... Um, <coughs> Uh, uh, you know, really uh, having an ensemble of uh, techniques uh, working together to somehow do something. Actually, even in this one, that is what they want to emphasize, that there will be this different range of fact extraction techniques. They will come up with different facts with different weights. And we do have some kind of a schem schematic knowledge to represent what we want to do and how to combine these two to come up with uh, better representations. So coming back to the slides, so this is a, a one rule that they have written for coreference entity. For an example, if we know uh, E1 and E2 entities are the same entities, and if we know the type of E1 is uh, L, and then we know the type of E2 is L. So the, they have defined these kind of rules uh, and assigned this continuous value for mm -hmm. each of the, the, the rule and also for each of the atoms which are out there. And uh, then they have uh, these kind of weights defined for the, uh, the ontological constraint or the schema constraints that they have. So how they come up with the exact value was the extensive experiment. I mean, they have come up with different number of weights and uh, see which one really works. And this is not their, this is not particularly uh, their contribution. This has been explored in number of other previous works as well. And now. We have uh, facts, we have weights for the facts, and then we have dependencies between the facts. For example, uh, word and country are mutually independent. So there is a dependent between these two variables. So what they do is they represent that information in a probabilistic graphical model. Now they want to drill down to the problem in problem to solve this using a probabilistic graphical model. So the what probabilistic graph graphical model need is these variables and the ways to their variables. So they represent whatever the information that they extracted from the previous uh, steps 
in a probabilistic graphical model. Now the problem will reduce down to how to how to solve this problem. So here what they what they are exploring is they are exploring a number of different interpretation that uh, this can have. For an example, uh, they will say, okay, uh, since we know uh, this has a higher truth values, the uh, that means the Kyrgyzstan as a country has a higher truth value, Kyrgyzstan as a bird also have a higher truth values, but we know these two are mutually exclusive, so there is some problem with this dependency. So they try to come up with multiple interpretations, that means multiple knowledge graphs, by changing these truth values and changing these dependencies, and then try to come up with uh, the optimized knowledge graph uh, for, for this particular problem. So this is now basically the out how to solve the probabilistic graphical model approach. I'm not going to uh, details of this one, so this is how uh, they use the uh, formula to come up with the, uh, the joint probability that they have to solve the which part of these are kind of manual, like the this junction, the, or these are, uh, you know, is that manual or is it uh, data, you know, uh, automatically from data? How do you know that this bird and this uh, thing are, are distinct based on... Oh, ontological representation is something somebody have done manually. So that part is manual. Right? So they have used the constraint defined in the constraint that have been defined by other people. So they do have, usually, uh, most of the automatic knowledge-based construction technique, I think, including yours, you guys have like a schema knowledge or ontology representation as the initial one. So they use those constraints. But how many of those uh, would you, so in this case, between some bird and some country, uh, you if you asserted this, you know, uh, this jointness. Mm -hmm. How many of these things you'll do? Uh, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the, this this depends on how uh, how good your schematic knowledge is. It, it depends on that. So did they do it? Uh, I mean, did they observe the data and then they put the rules or? They no, the rules are <coughs> predefined earlier. Whatever the constraints in the ontology, and also if you look at uh, this. How large are the schemas? What? How large are the schemas? Uh, that I'm not so sure. So uh, I'm. I don't think they're using all the information in the schema as well. They are limited to this set of rules, at least for the prototype that they have. So they're not exploring all, all the options. However, with the performance, they so they were able uh, to run. The point is, how many types there are in DBPDA? I can tell you in the nil. I think they have around uh, two hundred, around two hundred. So they have to do two hundred square uh, considerations. For no. Each of so these how how they do the optimization is using a convex function. So the rules. they have yeah using the rules. So I mean, these the rules, right? You have two basic items. You have to say something is mutually exclusive. You have to consider all these facts. That is what the point is. Right? Yeah. yeah. I think uh, as far as I remember, mean, they do not talk about this, but uh, what. Uh, I saw some video what they are saying is this is kind of uh, you can do this in a domain specific way to consider different tasks or domains and define your thing there rather than doing it for like doing it for NEL does not really make sense uh, because it's all a lot of web data right and you don't know what it is so but if you define it for a particular task there you can have your rules uh, and even for particular domain, so that is the that's what they call uh, identification. Like you, you have this big uh, thing, and you try to identify a particular knowledge graph for your domain or for your task. That's the kind of uh, use case uh, that makes sense. To uh, and, and the other thing is the since they do reasoning of all over their all all the data, it's a joint inference. So it is not only the fact that, okay, bird and country are mutually exclusive. That's one thing and they want, then they go and see, for an example, located in. Usually located in appears with countries. So the probabilistic graphical model, since they are looking about the dependencies of uh, the, between the variables, you might not need to define each and every constraint. Mm -hmm. That is, the, the reasoning happens jointly. 
Oh, so you mean the credit in is not going to happen for a verb, right? Like so the credit in a verb is not. This is how they are. Yeah, they yeah. Don't yeah. Have yeah. the same yeah. attributes. Okay. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Uh, but I do wonder about you know, how strong that kind of mutual exclusion is. I'm pretty sure there's going to be some country that has the same name as a bird. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're right, you're right. So that's why in that case, the joint inference again matters. Mm -hmm. So that there, there can be a bird with the same same name, mm -hmm. but bird won't have uh, the property called located in. Right. So th that's where the joint inference thing comes into the picture. And what I, I really like about this one is how they have use this statistical information in the probabilistic graphical model, then we don't need to rely on the whole hard reasoning approach to come up with that. For example, in this case, I think for, uh, if we talk about the numbers, yeah, for 4.3 million facts, they were able to run in two hours, which you really cannot imagine can be done in a traditional reason. But that was the most important part for me. And uh, so this is the, formula, I'm not going to de discuss detail about that. And then this is uh, uh, some bit of information about the evaluation. So actually they have done evaluation on a synthetic data set, that means they get an existing data set, uh, they, I think they took BBC Music, and then they have uh, incorporated some noise information, and then they try to see whether they can recreate the uh, original one. But that they have done in a very small one, which I didn't found really interesting. But uh, with NEL, like I said earlier, they have done it for 4.3 billion facts. Uh, so in that case, they were able to, so this is <coughs> NEL. Since NEL has reasoning, they have some heuristic rules to, come up with the, to remove the noise. So they have used that approach. So that is the one with the NEL. And then this is how they were able to improve the uh, performance using the probabilistic uh, soft logic uh, approach. So as you can see, they were able to improve the recall from 0 0.4 to 0 0.8. So to conclude, I find uh, this is a really interesting tool uh, to combine semantics and statistics. They work uh, really well. Uh, in accurately identifying a knowledge graph from a noisy knowledge graph. And I think we can also use this kind of a thing, not in the sense of the maybe the ontology of the knowledge graph itself, but the probabilistics of logic rule, when you have certain heuristics and then how to reasoning over them, in those scenarios also the probabilistics of logic uh, might be a handy tool to use. And I see like a couple of papers are coming and they are trying to use prob probabilistics of logic. There are tutorials if we want to uh, follow something on the probabilistics of logic. So that's it. Any questions? So I think you started by saying that knowledge, I mean, this NEL is com like you can compare it with knowledge graph, right? NEL, yes. Yeah. You I can. mean, the, the fact that you get from NEL is uh, similar to what Google knowledge graph has. No, no. 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 NEL is uh, noisy. It's much more noisy. It's much more noisy. So we haven't seen any application of <coughs> NEL. So remember, oh, even Google uh, knowledge graph is largely built by humans. So it's based on free base maybe, no? Yeah, yeah. but uh, any additions that happens, it is curated by humans. Okay, okay. They have, um, uh, I don't know exact number, but they have uh, some hundred um, uh, 100 plus uh, editors that are working. These are the guys who get paid hourly kind of things, similarly to what we paid annotators for us. And they, uh, you know, they check and they remove all the noise and junk. So this kind of thing, a human will say, oh, no, this is a country, Kazakhstan. So then the, the version of NEL for Google is the knowledge world? So knowledge world, the interesting thing is knowledge world has not gone anywhere. I, it, yeah. and I, I last heard they are stopped the project. Oh. And the, the quality, they will simply not get high, they're getting high. So Google hired a lot of people from CMU. The same, all these guys who kind of work, yeah. several people who work on NEL, Google hired them. Okay. And I think they were working on Knowledge Graph uh, Vault as far as I know. Results, NEL results are not impressive at all. If you look at it, really. If you see 0.63 uh, as a result, that means there's so much junk. At that level, humans would not accept quality at all. You really have to go 0.859 and above 
to you know say okay i'll take one in 10 junk i'll take two in 10 junk in my results or if you're going to get um, four in 10 10 is a junks in your results and those four in 10 uh, two of them appear in the top three that won't look good right so you must won't take there so uh, as far as i know uh, that knowledge vault google vault is not going anywhere um, and, um, and they may they may research, but the quality also is low. And surprisingly, number of facts are much higher in the Google Knowledge Graph compared to all other. Uh, Where did you get that? So these are, uh, I think this I presented last time for the Knowledge Graph meeting. So no, no. Where do you get that number of uh, one eighteen billion? I think uh, one some of the articles that we share. I have the resources I can share with you. Guys. That sounds high. That's a good size. Yeah. yeah. And huh? what is surprising is it is really high compared to all the automatic construction. Tools. I'm sorry? What, what, to what is that attributed? Is it, 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 it's, it's the same database, right? It's the same sources of... <clears throat> no, this, I think this one I got from a different article. These things uh, we are fairly familiar with. Uh, but I mean, it's the, same, it's the same corpus that you're mm. mining or whatever, the same. No. no. Okay, no. So, so then... I don't think we, Google we is. We can't compare because 18 million they, to 3,000. This is this probably won't use any corpus. These are human adding the facts to this. So, the Google Knowledge Graph initially built from Freebase, which is again a crowdsourced knowledge graph, okay. and they build on top of that. These no, 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 no. Freebase was manually built. It's not even crowdsourced. These are the, there are ten employees of uh, Meta Web <laughs> Company, uh, and they built it. Okay. No, but and it only had five million uh, nodes. And this is far, far, far larger than 5 million nodes. If, you are, if, if this number is correct, 18 billion, that's pretty large. Yeah. Keeping 18 million consistent by humans, 100, 150, 200 yeah, million is not possible. That, so something is, not, the, something is not matching. Yeah, that's what's surprising to me. But, uh, <clears throat> I think this they have reported in the Google Knowledge Wallet paper, which uh, is published. So, so what happens is that like you have something like a country uh, and a country has a capital. Mm -hmm. And then to get a knowledge, uh, all the list of 130s, some country and their corresponding country, that is easy, right? Mm -hmm. And you, so this, you, you can build up those relationships. Uh, entity types are just 1500, mm -hmm. if you think about it, look at it. So the entity types are, are all, all roughly in the ballpark, right? I mean, the same order of magnitude, right? Yeah. And those, so entity type is what? I mean, a country name. That's an entity type, right? Mm -hmm. Country. Huh? Country. Country, country is entity type. Yeah. City and well, river and whatever. Yeah. No, but if you have country name and you will have uh, and you'll have country um, uh, neighbors. Name and neighbors will be relations, right? Ah, okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. So. Um, yeah, but still, uh, fifteen hundred. Uh, so why are you getting so many more fat? I guess. You know, given the, the inputs, the number of entities, well, I guess you have five, I can't read that. Is it 5.7 million instances or, whoops. <laughs> no, so what I think what happens is like, uh, uh, so suppose you have, again, a, a prescription drug as an... 570, okay. Suppose you have, a, you know, G, a, you know, prescription drug as an entity, and then list of all the prescription drugs from a database, which would be a uh, few thousand. Mm -hmm. Right, sell about four, five thousand dollars. You know, prescription drugs out there. Uh, then they will all, you know, be in the facts, right? The number of facts. So the number of facts will really grow up by because most of them are incorporating databases, existing databases. This is what we did also in Tali and uh, Semagics uh, at That's what we did. What we did is we design schema by hand, but then we found large databases, curated databases that humans had developed. In finance, we'll go to a well-known company that have, uh, you know, all the uh, financial information on yeah. the web. We would write specialized extractors and then create, in, you know, database basically and then instantiate all our entities. So that you can quickly build up. Still 18 billion sounds high um, uh, because uh, <clears throat> suppose I have, um, uh, uh, let's say, a company traded on stock market. There are uh, roughly 5,000 companies traded on st uh, all the three stock markets in the US, roughly 5,000, right? Um, so, uh, but every day, few of them go down and few of them, new companies come in, right? Are you, are they able to keep that consistent? 
<laughs> That's the issue that yeah. comes up, right? You you once created it, fine. Yeah. But then these things keep on changing. Yeah. And how much of those things are keep consistent and how well consistent yeah. they are, those are the issue. But and given that, um, uh, if the, you in, in our case we had assumed that a particular source is high quality, so whatever data it gave, we will replace the current one with the new one, and thus does not involve human involvement. In some cases, it would not be possible to just say, oh, I believe in this source and that is my, you know, gold standard. Uh, and the human would have to look at it. How much of that they can keep up with these 16 billion, you know, uh, facts, uh, you know, up to date? That is a challenge and we don't know that. I mean, even in Wikipedia, I remember one of the culprits paper, he discussed the different number of population numbers for a given country. Yes, yes. <coughs> So, uh, since Google has said that they migrated the data from Freebase to Wikidata, uh, now Wikidata has 19.5 million items. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so 5 million to 19.5 million, right? Which is reasonable, yeah. right? Because they have so many more editors. MetaWeb only had uh, 8 to 10 people. These guys uh, now have, you know, um, somewhere in 100 to few hundred, uh, uh, you know, editors, curators. So, yes, uh, working for the last four years, they could clearly create that much, that, that is believable. The interesting thing is <clears throat> that this still appears to be a problem which is not, which is really hard to automate so much. 18 billion, if that number is correct, is very good facts because that's a lot of facts, right? How much of them are consistent? That is a question. How much of them are accurate? That is a, you know, up to date, and accurate. That is a question. Right? The larger the growth, the more the uh, effort in maintenance. It's not linear. Unless you have a community that is curating it. So if you take data from music brains, they are curating it. So you are not doing the work some, a whole group of people are doing it. A very large number of people are doing it. Hundreds of people, hundreds of people are doing it because they have passion. And that gives you good quality. And that's good enough quality. There is no other, I can't find any, think of any other resource that gives you better quality music database. So all you have to do is to automatically keep up to date as you know, every time there is a new version of it, or every time you can find a, a changes, change log to that. Those things can be automated. That's what we also automated. We had allmusic.com, which is, uh, you might say, similar to Music Brains, and that's what we did. So we had large facts for music coming from allmusic.com. That was community created. But how many of them can be done? So there will be some data sets that will not be, you know, that will not have that passionate and, you know, well, uh, managed community and that what do you do there how do you keep up to date those are the questions you'll have so the it'll you'll come up with a hybrid thing saying this data is highly up, you know up to date i know quality is good and this data is okay this is the best i have to the extent you apply for search um, if you have reasonably good quality data 80 percent 70 you know 80 percent and above i think people are happy because you get uh, uh, out of 10 results on the first page, if your 8 are good, you're happy. You don't care about the other 2 that did not go work well. <laughs> on the other hand, if those results are used by machine, not human, then you have trouble. Right? This whole... Because if the machine has to use, it will fall, you know, it will fail on the, those 2 that are wrong and everything will fall through. If human is doing it, human brain is using to filter, they, it will just ignore. It'll look for what he, he human wants and then go on. <clears throat> so what do we, what is concrete uh, from here that you're going to, and um, knowledge graph uh, KK G platform? Uh, I presented it because I found the, this probabilities of logic is, uh, is a really handy tool. Which, which is not limited to use of the knowledge graph project, but as a concept, how yeah. we have used yeah. it. Yeah. So, that, that, so, 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 but the point is, I think we need to have um, 
a good intuition in here. The very fundamental takeaway here is that is the intuition that which aspect of this problem solving is done by statistical means and which aspect is done by human involvement right so the rules the axioms the uh, schema is by humans <coughs> and uh, so you know this uh, some other part is done by statistics now remember most of the time <coughs> the statistical approach works only when quality of data is good or data is extremely large <coughs> right uh, and and data is so large that it is able to uh, you know um, you say, well, majority always comes up with a good result. Right? Then it doesn't matter. Almost anything that you're looking for, uh, you'll find that uh, on this thing, 7 out of 10 uh, agree. The next thing is uh, uh, 2 out of, uh, you know, 1 out of 10, then long trail. Right? So your judgment that the one that people agreed upon is good enough and that's what you go with. Is a reasonable thing, right? Um, so I think uh, so when you generate the statistics and the corresponding data from which you generate statistics is, you know, going to lend to that, then I think that works very well. When you can combine these two, they are plus, you know, they are really complementary. Then yes, it it does make sense. Logically, it does make sense. So, which of our problems in just general uh, that we can have, you know, we have some data, we have some human curators, we have some ontology builders, that we can apply this, that's, that's the question. But anytime you can figure this out. Now, you know, um, I think that there is work to be done if you take exactly this problem, issue and ask um, <clears throat> a, a couple of questions. One is how, what is the continuous semantics part of it? What is the... Uh, what do you do to keep this up to date? Uh, what do you do to identify new type that must be added? And then, you know, continue to do that, right? So that will be one problem. Um, you know, the Sujan looked at, you know, automatically updating a knowledge base from, you know, new facts that are in the text kind of thing. So that is a, 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 an interesting area of work. Other is saying, how does this thing... Um, work out in a domain such as bioinformatics or bi biomedical or uh, or healthcare or some such thing uh, where we could have um, resemble about data and uh, you can say well we need to keep up with all the uh, facts so I don't know which of our um, knowledge bases have the characteristics where um, it's relatively dynamic and then what do we do and yet, and, 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 and how the issues are um, different from a general, you know, entire web based resource like Knowledge Graph, Google Knowledge Graph versus uh, individual domain thing. Where, um, <clears throat> for example, in biomedic, in bio, in clinical, um, the, you know, the implicit uh, detection problem that Sujan looks at, you have, um, um, you know, doctor specifying that there's a there's a clinical term, but doctor specifies using in a description language. The distinction now between that clinical term and this description language is quite significant, right? So the problems are inherently challenging. They're not the same kind of problem as as a you know a bird or a or, or country kind of thing. So, so, so I think that in the, you'll come, you, you naturally come across those kind of thing when um, people write uh, in the social media. People write informally, and they don't uh, necessarily work hard to uh, uh, adhere to standard or, or you know, standard terms. Or in things like clinical things, the, there are nuances. The reason the doctor does not use that particular clinical term is because he wants to express certain nuance. That the clinical term itself doesn't capture. There's only so much uh, terminology will capture. But the body is far more complex. And so, why something, you know, it, it, you know, um, 
I mean, there are examples in, in his presentation that I think you could, could quickly look up, but there are a number of reasons why uh, the doctor wants to actually describe indirectly what it, it means because that direct term is not um, informative enough. It doesn't capture everything that is to be captured in the domain. So that is a depth of the domain, which gives us the intro, you know, thing. It is that aspect that I think our thing need to really focus on and that, you know. Yeah. Right, because you see, we are, we are not going to be able to compete with, and well, the, there's so many people who have been working on things like NEL for long, such a long time. There are some fundamental limitations. Uh, there are some issues uh, in accessing a huge amount of data and huge computation. But in the domain, we have these new challenges, new insights, new you know something that a problem that are purely not solvable by these mass techniques.